fuck? I beefed that so hard. Oh god. Oh Jesus fuck. Moki. Moki sounds. Only a true genius of OSTs would put Moki sounds in the background of his uh, tracks. Uh, we got another review stream here for you today, folks. Oh, this is so loud in my ears. Hold on. Oh, there we go. I'm turning into a monkey. Dude, if he reviews Lilo and Stitch Hamster Reveal Havoc today, I'm gonna shit bricks. <laughs> I might get around to it, we'll see. Is it on here? It's it's down, I think. Or wait, where is it? Oh fuck, did I not even finish? Oh my god, that's so embarrassing. Okay, you guys can't see it, so it's fine. It's oh my oh my god. Oh, oh. Sorry, I had to clear my throat. Uh, we got some cool art here. I, I figured I might as well use this now because there's not going to be any more uh, Celeste Strawberry Jam streams. This is from The GB. It's just a very cute art. Very cute Strawberry Jam art. And I will be reviewing that today, I think. So, uh... You know, that's fine. What, what do I mean, that's fine? Like... I mean, like... This is the closest we're going to get to having the art be relevant. So thank you for this lovely art, uh, The GB. Very cool, very cute. Uh, appreciate it as always. This is the embarrassing thing. Uh, hold on. Wait, I'm gonna turn off the music. So, to anybody who hasn't joined us for review streams in the past, yeah, it's gonna be this. We're gonna be staring at a spreadsheet most of the time. Wait, why is it like off? Oh, I see why it's off. Now it should be good? Oh god, no, please recenter properly. No, no, that's gonna bug me. Ooh, that's gonna bug me real bad. Hold on. Basically, we're gonna be looking at a spreadsheet this entire time. I'm gonna have to, like, readjust this, I think. Nope. Did it fix itself? No, it didn't. Fuck! Okay, well, hold on. Just the very top of this is, like, weird. Uh, but basically, this is a spreadsheet of all the games that I've ever streamed. And we're going to... Just, I'm going to review them out loud. Uh, there's still a tiny bit left. No, please, I don't want to do the other thing. I hate OBS sometimes. OBS is so, it's such nonsense. The way it handles, like, layering. Okay, I think we should be good now. Yeah, cool. So, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to talk about all the games that I've streamed in the past. 
this is the spreadsheet. This is how far we have got in the spreadsheet. I have never once been caught up on like the games that I've played. There's a few gaps here. Bikman 269 is up here, which that's an ongoing series, so I'm not going to review it. Same with We Love Katamari Reroll, although I'm pretty sure I'm going to probably give it the exact same score. Uh, like, I don't think Royal Reverie was enough to bring that up to a 10. Uh, so basically, there's going to be no background noise, there's going to be no music or anything. I'm going to be listening to my own tunes and or fucking ASMR videos in the background. But I encourage you to either use these streams as background noise for like something you're working on or something. I don't know. You're doing chores, you want to listen to something, maybe you could do that. Or you could put on your own music behind it. It's not, they're not the most entertaining to just like sit here and stare at the screen. So just a warning. Uh, Deltarune, I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to review that yet because uh, the, the full game doesn't yet exist, which I think I'm going to be waiting quite a while for that one. So maybe I'll, maybe, I don't know, I might do like a temporary review. Here's the first one we're actually going to do. And then uh, the, the embarrassing thing that I was talking about earlier is that I didn't, I didn't sort the Hamsterville Havoc or getting over it with Bennett Foddy into the list. So let's actually, let's see if it does, does the thing where it snaps all the way to the top. No? Come on. No, it did. It snapped all the way to the top. No idea why that happens. It just happens sometimes. It's like, you, there's like a certain like schmism that you have to have with like dragging the cursor. So we're going to put it in here. Unforgivable. So we're going to drag this two down. There's probably way more efficient ways of doing this. There's probably people out there who are like Excel wizards who are like, dude, this is really how you organize this shit. And there's no rhyme or reason to the way these games are organized, too. They're just... It's nonsense. Like, I've vaguely grouped together... I grouped together, like, arcade games and bullet hells. This is, like, the bullet hell zone. Right here. And... Besides that, it's like sometimes series will be next to each other. Uh, at the top is all Nintendo games. At the bottom is a bunch of other like random series. It, and then I otherwise they're basically they're in chronological order of how I streamed them, the order I streamed them in. But we're getting near the end. Uh, so let's let's get plowing through here. This is probably going to be a relatively short one, too. Uh, these, these streams take a lot out of me because I'm just talking the whole time. There's no game to, like, lean on. It's like, I can't just be like, oh, I'll just, like, shut up and play the game for a little bit. No, that's not a thing. Okay, ASMR on. Hopefully you guys can't hear this. Because uh, people, people hate, some people hate ASMR. People get so pissed. Whatever. Celeste Strawberry Jam. This was a mod for Celeste, and it was a huge community thing with a ton of levels, unbelievable amount of content, uh, divided up into different, like, different difficulty segments, where there was, like, beginner stuff through, like, god-tier stuff, basically. And it's really, really good. I could not personally bring myself to complete like more than half of it. I, I don't think I even got halfway through all the content. And like there's there's five worlds. The first I felt like the first three, by my estimation, were things that were gonna be completable by me. That were like be beginner, intermediate, advanced. And then there's expert, and then there's uh oh, what is it actually called? Like God something Grandmaster, I think. Uh Expert and Grandmaster, I just didn't... I was like, okay, those probably aren't going to be on the table. Maybe I'll do one or two Expert levels. I ended up not even getting all the way through the Advanced Lobby. Uh, because it just got too frustrating for me. And uh, I love Celeste. I love the controls of Celeste. There were things that a lot of these levels... Particularly brought out of like the system of, of Celeste that were annoying to me. Uh, it's hard to do, it's hard to keep something like this consistent when it's a ton of levels made by a bunch of different people, where, like, every level was made by a different person. Some of them just are, some of them are amazing. Like, some of them are just bursting with creativity, 
great music, fantastic original visuals, really fun gameplay gimmicks. Each each level usually has its own unique gimmick of some type. Uh, super fun, cool stuff going on in those regard in, in those levels. And you know, it's a gradient. Some of them are like slightly good, and some of them are slightly bad, and some of them are amazing. But then there's always the, thrown into the mix are a bunch of uh, not not too many, but they always just I felt like they brought the game to a grinding halt, and I did not enjoy playing them. Was a lot of the puzzle levels where it's more about figuring out a specific it's rather than executing difficult platforming, it's like figuring out the precise correct order to do things in. I kind of appreciate that they were going for something different. Drop Soul was probably my favorite of the puzzle levels. The rest of them just felt like they were... I was like, man, just let me play Celeste. I, I, I just want to play Celeste. And I know that's like a very reductive way to put it. But I think Celeste actually, you know, has those puzzle-like elements in its normal gameplay to a way that is perfectly satisfactory to me and I don't need it to be any more puzzly. And so those, they, they felt like a Portal 2 co-op uh, online level that was like user made, you know, where some of them I was just like, man, I, like I feel stupid or this level is just like ridiculously hard in terms of its puzzles. But overall, I would still, I would still say that this is a game that is worth, even if you think you might have a similar like drop off point to me where there's just a certain point where I'm just like, man, like, I like these levels, I like the gimmicks, that it's just, it's just too hard, and, like, so frequently, I'm like, man, I just cannot dash in the correct fucking direction consistently enough to nail all these huge sequences of inputs. Even if you think you're gonna have a similar experience, the beginner lobby, man, if you just want to do, I, I think, a solid Celeste fan game for casual Celeste players like me, is Celeste Beginner and Intermediate Lobby. With like and, and each lobby ends with a heart side that's like a big compilation level of uh all the levels in the area. Those heart sides are really cool, they're really long, and they're way more difficult than their uh original level counterparts. It's like the intermediate heart side feels like it's prepping you for doing advanced because uh it's just so many, like, leagues more difficult. At least in my opinion. But I liked it. I'm not sure, like, yes, recommend, definitely. It was very cool. Just, uh, you know, set realistic goals for yourself. Like, the advanced level was, the advanced lobby was hard. Like, there was, there was a bunch of stuff in there. It, it, maybe I was getting a little, like, frustrated well, more than a little frustrated but like maybe frustration was building over time and that's just where i hit the point of like i don't want to do this also if you're a keyboard player i genuinely feel like if you play this game on keyboard you will have a way better time with this game because a lot of my annoyances and complaints just came down to on my controller i'm holding down and right why does the character on the fucking screen not dash down and right like so frequently and i know it's probably my fault but that's just how it felt so much of the time something about the way the like dead zones are on the controller support for this game somebody offered to mod this game for me for me to to, to make it like more enjoyable I, I didn't really like that idea uh so i don't know just word of warning on controller I, th I feel like higher level celeste stuff is just harder to enjoy because it just feels it feels inconsistent even though it might not be even though it might be completely consistent it feels inconsistent anyway bitching done uh man this was such a good mod this is like crazy good i think in terms of like again it's not super consistent some levels are kind of stinky but 95% of the levels were amazing. Uh, so anyway, 8.5, let's just leave it at that. I think that's fair. There's certain things, you know, you don't, you don't get a cohesive story or anything at all from the Strawberry Jam, but that's fine. You know, it's just for like enjoyers of the gameplay. Uh, okay, huge, by the way, we, we went all the way down because again, 
the only reason I put strawberry jam up there is because it has to go next to Celeste. Even though fucking Celeste Classic 2 through Celeste X are just chilling down here. I just noticed. I should fix that. Anyway. Uh, snipper clips, cut it out together. Nobody ever says the cut it out together part, but you guys know I am dedicated to putting the proper full title of a game on this list. Uh, this is a very fun, cute game for Switch. I feel like it's pretty well known, even though I, maybe not everybody has played it. It, it kind of almost feels like a uh, a pack-in game for the Switch, even though it isn't, and it doesn't actually show off. It, it's not like showing off the capabilities of the Switch. It just has that vibe to it, where it's kind of inoffensive. Uh, very cute visuals you know everybody there's there's a slightly it's a, i guess to anybody who doesn't know this is a game where you play as two little like eraser shaped things and you can cut shapes out of each other and and there are puzzles based around that so it's like and some of them get pretty complicated where it's like you need to cut one person into a shape then use that shape to cut the other person into a different shape blah blah, blah. there's a variety of uh themed challenges around these abilities it's very fun. I think it's actually quite, like, puzzle games are hard to do. I was complaining about puzzle Celeste levels earlier. Puzzle games are quite hard to do, uh, like, just right so that they're just difficult enough that you feel like you've accomplished something, but not so difficult that you're just sitting there going, I'm stupid for, like, two hours before you figure it out. Uh, somebody point said in the chat something that I was about to say, great soundtrack on this game. Shockingly good. It's just very cute music. I, I remember somebody saying that, like, Omocat, the creator of Omori, like, made a song for this game. I looked that shit up before the stream, and I could not find a single thing confirming that. But it sure as hell sounds like Omori music. At least some of it. Uh, but uh, actually, very good music. Just a, a nice, like... It's like the video game equivalent of, like, easy listening music, where it's like, ah, this just feels nice. Some of the puzzles can be f kind of frustrating sometimes. Uh, there's sort of a janky physics engine that you're working with, and I feel like sometimes you can sort of brute force a dumb solution. Uh, but I kind of like that. I, I'm not even going to say that that's a mark against the game. I kind of enjoy that. Uh, there's a kind of... There's a weird sexual nature to this game. And... Does it, you guys you guys get what I mean when I say that, right? Like, the characters' faces always have this kind of, like, little, like, Ew. like, weird, like, sex feel to them. And, like, when you reform your character, they go, like, <laughs> and it's something about it is just ever so slightly horny. And it's funny. I think it's done to, like, a perfect degree where it's not, like, OMG, Ahegao, this game is so sexual. But it's also, it's like, it's funny and cute, I think. Honestly, it's like a weird, it's like an ever so slightly horny game. So, uh, that's just something that I think is funny about it. It's, it's got a weird identity, but it's, uh, it's certainly not like, it's not like lewd. But it's perfect, it's perfect for streamers to sit there and go, <laughs> I'm in you, <laughs> you know? So, uh, it's a great game, though, I think. I, I don't know. I feel like this is an 8. Oh, God. Of course the conditional formatting is not working. It's not like a revolutionary experience or anything, but I think it is a solid game. Cursed memories of seeing Game Grumps thumbnails, huh? Hold on, hold on. That wasn't Game Grumps? Oh, okay. I was gonna say, these, these look pretty tame. Okay, whatever. I was curious what cursed shit they had put there. Okay, oh god, Fortnite. We're on Fortnite, everybody. Calm down, everybody settle down. Uh, I enjoyed playing Fortnite for about two and a half hours. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, I never need to play this again as long as I live. I actually did play it a few more times with, uh, with Bella after. But 
and and yes, as I have noted here, it was Battle Royale. Uh, it, 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 this game is befuddling to me. I, I think at a basic level, of course, Battle Royale games have an appeal to them. I don't, I don't think I am like the target audience. I don't think I like jive with it perfectly because uh, I don't know. I'm not huge into online multiplayer in general, let alone an online multiplayer game where you're basically never going to win. <laughs> Even though, like, yes, they try to ease you in. So when you start playing Fortnite, they just put you in a bunch of, like, bot matches and pair you up with, like, six-year-olds. So I got a few wins. But I feel like from every... Maybe this is just hearsay, because I, I don't think I ever actually really got to this point. But the thing that I always hear about Fortnite is that, like, at a certain level there's always going to be, like, sweat lords who are just going to be way better at the game than you. I, I, I guess there's also been a lot of balance changes. Maybe I, I shouldn't in incorporate that into my review if it wasn't actually my personal experience. I just don't think I played it long enough to get out of, like, the baby zone. Uh, but the gameplay is at a basic level fun. I just think uh, there is nothing exceptional about it. Like, it's got smooth 3D animation. I think, tonally, this game is just a complete fucking nightmare. It's so, like, it's so vapid consumerism core. Like, everything, it, it, I said it feels like a, I, what was the comparison I made to, like, one of those Spider-Man Elsa videos, you know? Where, uh... It just feels like it's it's there's no attempt to keep a consistent tone whatsoever. And I really appreciate tone and atmosphere in games. And games like this, it's like I'm playing Coco Melon. So just aesthetically, I don't get anything out of this game. And I think it's 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 just very annoying. <laughs> like a lot of there's so many like obnoxious skins and all the dances and all the like emotes with like current pop song in them and shit stuff like that just makes me feel like a grumpy old man and maybe i am a grumpy old man but that's these are my reviews <laughs> uh the gameplay felt fine i'm i'm also not a huge fan of uh it, it kind of has a little bit of, like, Skinner boxiness to it. With the whole, oh, like, you, you can just randomly get weapons that are just way better versions of weapons that are lying around everywhere. You know, the whole, like, rare, ultra-rare, legendary, epic, or whatever. I don't remember exactly what they are. But stuff like that, I, I feel like there's just a few things about this game. and And along with, it's like... There are things in games like this that feel like they're put there to get you addicted to playing it. And stuff like that, like the looting system feels that way. Uh, the like, oh, you like got XP for doing this thing and now you leveled up your character and you get a free like emote or whatever with that. But you get, but, but they taper it off. Like you start off with super easy games, winning a lot, getting a lot of like loot and stuff and gear and cosmetics. But then it slows down over time, and, and the time between the next, like, hit of dopamine becomes longer and longer, and it's, it's insidious. And it's got battle passes. Yeah, games... Exactly. Games as a service were a tragedy to begin with. It just... Even if it's not directly negatively impacting me, it's just, like, it feels bad, man. You know? So... I don't know. It was... But, but the thing is... Spider-Man Elsa videos are funny. It's hilarious that they exist. And, like, it's such a... It's almost like it comes around, it goes, it goes so schlocky corporate capitalist bullshit that it almost comes back around to being, like, a pop-punk, like, reflection of how fucked media culture is right now. And it's, it's like, hilarious. In a way. And that, that was a lot of the enjoyment that I got out of it. Was like, this like delirious, like, yeah, I'm, Thanos is beating up Goku 
and I'm dressed as a cat, and fucking there's Miles Morales is over there sniping down Superwoman. That's not even a character. Something about it is like, it's like a beautiful fever dream. But it's not something, it's not a world I want to stay in for more than, again, like two hours. Like, does that make any sense at all? He's literally six months old. Dude, I love, yo, oh my god. Funniest moment in all of television. When Spider-Man got out the giant syringe and stuck it in Elsa's belly and then, like, she got pregnant. That was, I was rolling on the floor laughing my ass off. <laughs> Superman, Superwoman is a, is a character? Is a woman? Anyway, I... <sighs> This is all to say, I don't know if I can recommend Fortnite. I recommend Fortnite for like an hour. Play it for like two hours and then never touch it again as long as you live. Because, careful, they might suck you in. You know, like quicksand. I almost want to type yes for like three hours. Elsa Flash games are peak gaming. Yeah, I gotta do a Flash game Friday that's just all, like, disgusting fucking, like, Disney princess, like, foot inspection games and shit. I feel like you could do such a... Like, are people studying this shit with, like, mobile game ads? Things that are designed to, like, sucker in children all have this, like, weird, like... It's like a fetishistic feel to it. Where it's like, oh, stinky, uh, stinky things, farts and like feet and stuff. Oh, uh, the, the boob and the, and the farts. And it's like, this is meant to, like, what is it doing in children's brains that is making them want to download these games? Because clearly it works. Obviously it works. Mike watches Finger Family often. Mike is a special case. Mike is a very special case. If they're like drawn to inappropriate or taboo things. That's exactly what it is. And stuff like pregnancy or, or things that are painful, like something that is significant to children. Syringes. We're, we're going on a big tangent here, but syringes show up in like shit like that so often. Thankfully, you don't like... You remember when YouTube literally had to like change the rules of the website to make it so that people weren't getting shown... I, like Elsa Spider-Man videos <laughs> like I remember the time when like you would just get recommended that shit and you'd be like dude what the fuck <laughs> why am I being shown this and then that's when they introduced Copa which was uh, that was the thing that a lot of YouTubers were worried was gonna kill YouTube but then it turned out that uh, YouTube just like poorly phrased the announcement for Copa, and really the thing in 2020 that we should have been afraid of, was, afraid of was COVID, not Copa. I, like, can't talk right now. Anybody notice that I'm, like, stumbling over my words super hard? At the beginning of this stream, I, I like, fucked up playing the music. All the VOD watchers are gonna see it. And I think I'm just, like, flustered from that. Anyway, uh, Fortnite, so, uh, Six and a half out of ten? I don't know. It's so, like, bland. Ugh. But it is, it's like sticking your hands in a bucket of wet slop grins. You know? Five? Everybody's saying five? Guys, you don't get to choose what I rate Fortnite. That, that's not how this works. Uh, okay, Placid Plastic Duck Simulator. Hard to rank this as a game. It is uh, truly one of those things that is barely a game at all. Um, like, I really don't even know what to say. It, it is a cute, funny little thing. Everybody, everybody was uh, going nuts over this for like one week when it came out. And I feel like any humor value or like entertainment value that it has had is kind of lost. It's kind of a zen little thing. But, uh, basically this is a game where you get a little pool, and it randomly spawns in little rubber ducks, or plastic ducks, I guess, uh, over the course of a long period of time. Well, I just realized I'm wearing my wrist brace for, like, no reason, and it's getting, like, gross and sweaty. I'm not even using the mouse. Uh, 
and there's some fun stuff. It's kind of it, it's an idle game basically. Uh where you have minimal input, you can't really control where the ducks go, but you click on like it's like a gift box shows up and you click on it and a duck comes out. Okay, there's your interaction. You can move the camera around and center it on different ducks. You can name the ducks. Uh, some of them have special effects where it's like, oh, this one breathes fire, and then the the ones that are like flammable catch on fire if it breathes on them. Like there's a wood duck that like catches fire and stuff like that. Uh, it kind of has the same appeal as watching a DVD logo bounce around a screen and waiting for it to hit the corner absolutely perfectly. I think that's like, it's a similar type of appeal to this game. Where you're just sort of like sitting there watching, just waiting for something to happen. And like things can happen. Like the one that has a propeller beanie can just like fly off the map, you know? And, and waiting for that one to eventually do that is in a way entertaining. It's, it feels so pathetic talking about this game because it's like, <laughs> this is like a baby sensory game, <laughs> if, if nothing else. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, not really, it's not really much of a game. And I'm a guy who, you know, I don't like to get anal about, you know, oh, is this a game? Is this not a game? But this one really is like, basically as little interaction as possible. Like, they could only make it less interaction if you couldn't name the ducks, couldn't move the camera, and couldn't, like, choose when they spawn in. <laughs> but, uh... It, it, was, it, it was entertaining for a while, while playing it. That, that's the thing. It's just very different from a lot of other types of games. It kind of reminds me of, uh... Did I review this one yet? I must have. I don't even remember what it was called, but there was a game about, like, growing plants, or no, Mountain. It was Mountain. I haven't played the plant one on stream yet. There was this game called Mountain, where it's just like a floating mountain in space, with like a few little things that you can do to manipulate it, and just objects, over the course of like hours and hours, objects will just fall from space and land on the mountain, and you can like play with them. And that's basically it. It's similar to that. But anyway, uh, I don't know. This, this is one where I really, like, it's up to your personal taste. I guess I'll recommend it. I guess I'll say I got a kick out of it. It's $3, and I got a kick out of it for, like, two days. So I'd say that's pretty good. Um, let's give it... <laughs> I don't know. What if I give it the same as Fortnite? What if I get... No, I mean... Honestly, like, as much as I would love to sit here and be snarky and be like, oh yeah, I liked this more than I liked Fortnite. Frankly, uh... I give this like a six. It's not... It's not the best experience, but, it, you know, it has features... It's totally true. I, I, I like to reiterate every single time I stream reviews that the numbers are not meant to be compared to one another. The numbers are not meant to be thought about super intensely at all. Like, they're, they're just kind of... They're kind of arbitrary, in a way. Like, I try to do them, like, accurately in my head. Like, this is the... The way that I phrase it is this, is, this number is, like, the amount of enjoyment that I got out of the game. I don't know, like, to me a 10 is like, I can't think of anything I disliked about it. I guess. It's like, for every, for all the things that I dislike about a game, I subtract some from 10. I guess that's how it really works. I don't know. Don't think about it too hard. Really, it's just what I'm saying out loud is the actual review. Like, that's, that's what you should really take into consideration. If anybody, does anybody use this as like a buying guide? Does anybody care? I honestly, I don't mind if nobody cares, but I'm curious. Uh, okay, Duck Game. This is uh, part of a, a genre of games that has become pretty popular in the last 10, 20 years, maybe like 10 years. 
uh, definitely not 20. The, like, local multiplayer arena platformer game. And this was one of the early ones. I feel like this was an early adopter of it. This game, I'm not the biggest fan of. It is mildly funny. You play as ducks. There's a dedicated quack button. That's very funny. Uh, and you basically, like, you're just bumbling around this, like, sort of, like, little physics level and uh, using zany weapons to kill the other person. I feel like this game is entertaining for, like, half an hour, and then it loses its flavor. But uh, that's just me. That being said, I feel as though even, like... Even in the context of its own genre, it's not really the best. Like, I've played other games like this that I enjoyed way more. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the controls. It's just... It, it, I, it's always a little awkward to play for me for whatever reason. And a lot of it just relies on knowing what all the zany weapons do and knowing how to like use them to your advantage, which I think doesn't give the game a lot of longevity. Maybe that's just me, but I was not the biggest fan. Uh, it's inoffensive though. It is like, it is like a fine game. It's like play it at a party with some friends for like, again, like half an hour and then move on. <laughs> I think is is my rating of it. Uh, okay, Sonic and All Stars Racing Transformed Collection. This is one of the biggest clusterfucks of a title I've ever seen in my life. Sonic and All Stars Racing Transformed Collection. Holy shit! Compare that to like Mario Kart Eight. You know, how hard is it to just give it a normal fucking name? I will never get over this name. I know this is like a, uh, this is like the second version of the game. Yes, this is the one with the TF2 characters in it, right? Yes, it is. This game, not only, this game has a botched title and a botched roster. The gameplay is basically just Mario Kart. Like, straight, straight down to, uh, you know, the transformed part is... The Mario Kart 8 gimmick, where you're, like, going underwater and going in the air and your uh, car transforms. It's basically just Mario Kart, but it plays worse. Not a lot worse, but worse enough that I don't think there's... Why would you play this? Why would you play this? The funny thing about this game, besides the botched title, is the botched roster. The character roster is just, like... Man... They just didn't have much to work with in terms of, like, Sega IPs. Like, Mario Kart, and I, sue me for comparing this to Mario Kart. Fucking come at me. It begs the comparison. Mario Kart has a pretty consistent aesthetic in the recent games they've uh, dipped into. Like, in Mario Kart 8 and Deluxe, they've dipped into having Animal Crossing Villager, having Link in there. Nothing that has really destroyed the aesthetic, though. But the aesthetic and, like, the tone and the roster of this game is just fucked all to hell. It's got the TF2 character that is three different TF2 classes in one. Uh, it's got Wreck-It Ralph. It has Yogg's cast in it. You can play as Yogg's cast. Uh, like, they should have... They, they definitely should have just made... If they were trying to make a competitor to Mario Kart... They definitely should have just made it Sonic characters instead of having the fucking guy from Crazy Taxi and Oolala from Space Channel 5 and like Samba de Amigo. There's a bunch of like games and like not speaking to the quality of these games. I like Crazy Taxi. I like Space Channel 5, even though I haven't actually fucking played it. Uh, why did you go with overall like Sega characters instead of just doing a Sonic cart, basically? Wasn't there an actual real racer in that, too? Probably. But, uh, it's just such a, like, aesthetic clusterfuck. And, and the TF2 classes is the one that I can't get over. Like, Yogg's cast is hilarious, too. Wreck-It Ralph is also funny. But TF2, you can be spy TF2. 
in the Sonic and All Stars Racing Transformed collection. I guess it's like specific to the uh, Steam version, but oh my god, Th they should have focused the like scope of this game a little more. Because I know they also, you know, they don't want to just have a bunch of Sonic themed levels. So they have, like the the tracks are one of the coolest parts, where it's like, oh, there's a Samba de Amigo level. That's cool, but man. They so could have done something good with uh, just Sonic characters. But then, I think, you know, then they fall into the pitfall of why the fuck, like this was something that somebody says, people say about this game anyway. Why the fuck is Sonic driving a car? Isn't the whole thing with Sonic that he goes fast? Why don't they just make a game where it's a racing game where Sonic and Sonic's friends run racing against each other? And then you think, oh wait, that's fucking Sonic R. And Sonic R sucked ass. <laughs> I feel like they just, they just don't even want to touch that concept anymore. So they're in a weird, they have to like make a weird compromise. Uh, so I don't know, this game just feels, it feels so botched. Yeah, I mean, Sonic R soundtrack is good. But they didn't want to make Sonic R again, but honestly, I think the based move would have been really to try to make Sonic R again. Rather than be like, oh, here's our, like, gimmick kart racing franchise game. They should have, they should have focused it, because it, it just feels like a mess. Anyway, uh, no. Literally, why would you play this? Why? I can't think of a reason besides see the funny characters in the levels and laugh for a bit. But it's it's really not even that entertaining entertainingly bad or anything. It's just it's just like why would you play this? Uh give it like a again it's a functional game too. Like it's a functional racer. Just not as fun as Mario Kart <laughs> and doesn't have the beautiful consistent aesthetic of something like Mario Kart 8. Even though Mario Kart 8, I guess it has, like, fucking Mute City, but even that feels like it fits. Uh, I'll give it, like, a 5. I'll give it also a 5, actually. Fuck it. Braid. Okay. This, because it was in Breaking Bad. Oh, my God. It was in Breaking Bad. That is true. <laughs> anyway. That's so funny to think about. I, I remember seeing that, actually. I remember, like, when watching Breaking Bad. It's like Jesse Pinkman is playing it at one point in, like, a drug house, right? Because only crackheads would play Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transform Collection when they could be playing Mario Kart. Anyway. Braid. Good-ass game. This game, I feel like, gets a lot of flack thrown at it because of its creator, Jonathan Blow, who, in recent years, has become a controversial figure and also has always been kind of seen as uh, pretentious. But uh, I, I really genuinely love Braid. I think it's a fantastic platformer. It's one where uh, you can rewind time at any time, and then there's a bunch of... Each level has its own little suite of uh, time manipulation, time travel gimmicks. Oh my god, I'm sorry. My stomach is going like... <laughs> Uh, so it's a very good, well-designed, solid puzzle game. Uh, it's, it's one that definitely, like some screens, I sit there and, and just like scratch in my head for like an hour, for sure. Like it, it, it's definitely one of those, but some of them, a, a lot of the screens have like very simple, elegant solutions that feel really satisfying to figure out the mechanics. I think it expands on its mechanics really well over time. I think... Yeah, there's a lot to look into, there's a lot to read into for, like, the story of the game, but even if you don't, like, it's, I think it's hard to grasp exactly what is going on in the story of this game, uh, especially considering there's, like, weird stuff about, like, nukes in the game. It's like, was it about nukes the whole time? It, it kind of just felt like it was the story about, like, an incel, like, being weird to somebody, but I think even if you don't vibe with the story and you know the whole thing where you have to like before a chapter you there's this room with like a bunch of books and you can just read from the books that is uh 
a little like i can see why people would not enjoy that and feel like wow this is like really sloppy like exposition dump but i think there are there are lots of ways that the story is presented that are quite compelling that I think are cool. There's lots of cool little moments in the game, even if you don't uh, really have any appreciation for like the overall thing. I still feel like I didn't have a great grasp on exactly what this game was trying to say, but you get sort of a feeling of it. You get you, you get a vibe of it, even if you don't understand understand it on a literal level. Uh, but I think it would be fair to to I think accuse this game of being slightly up its own ass. That's fine, and I think it's a really it's a really great game, like. I feel like I want to give this one like a nine. It's like one of my favorite platformers. Maybe I'm a little nostalgia blinded there. It's also just got really nice visuals, this sort of like hand painted style. And uh, the music is very soothing to listen to. And it's just such a tightly designed, really solid little puzzle platformer with a really cool ending. Really, really, really cool ending. Uh, anyway. Let's go with, yes, of course, obviously. Pizza Tower, okay. Right, I played Braid one day and then started Pizza Tower the next day. And that was such a jarring, like, name two more different platformers. <laughs> uh, of course, Pizza Tower was great. I have basically nothing but good things to say about it. Uh, this is one that I, I remember hearing about for a long time, like... Hearing about people, like, I, I saw, like, Vinny playing, like, the demos and shit for it, and I was like, oh, that looks interesting, but it doesn't seem like it's anything more than just kind of Wario Land spiritual successor with slightly funny graphics. But, uh, goddamn, did it blow my expectations out of the water. Uh, not only, I mean, I got sent a fucking key for this game, which was amazing, and then it was really, really good. Like, usually when I get sent a key for something, it's not, like, the one of the best games I've ever fucking played. But, uh... Really, really wowed me. Amazing graphics, amazing music. The art style is just so energetic and, like, explosive. The soundtrack is impeccable. I think the levels are really fun to play. The controls... The controls take a little getting used to. Uh, it, I, I feel like about halfway through the game, I was finally like, okay, I, I basically get the vibe of using these controls. Because they're slightly unconventional, the whole like wall running thing in a 2D platformer. I've, I'm sure there are games that have done that. Jerma said that Roadrunner for the SNES had the same thing. But uh, I really, 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 really liked it. And I, I got a lot of enjoyment out of it. This was a game that I think is fun to play casually just to beat the game it's a decent challenge but it is also incredibly fun if you're more into it to uh go for completion on and get p ranks p ranking a level in pizza tower is like it's it's like one of the biggest like fucking dopamine rushes i've ever had in a video game it feels so good and the levels are so well structured to facilitate casual play or high-ranking play, you know? And uh, I think it was the perfect amount of challenge. There were some things there was like, there was literally like one part in the entire game where I was like, hmm, it doesn't really feel like they thought super hard about the likelihood that people will keep their combo going through this part of the level. The one section in Gnome Forest where it's like you have to play basically perfectly to keep your combo. That was it. And and that is not a big complaint. Like that is that is oh one tiny bit of this level was like annoying and felt weirdly designed. That's it. Uh it is one of the most satisfying things to do to P rank a level and and it and it's it's surprisingly doable. Like when you first hear about like oh you know if you get absolutely everything in the level, all the secrets, keep a combo going the entire time, and reach a certain point requirement. Like, and you have to do lap two and everything. Like, no fucking way I will be able to do that. But once you get the hang of the controls, it's actually surprisingly... Like, it's not easy to do. It is surprisingly attainable. Uh, and I think that's, that's a wonderful balance that this game achieves. That for... High level and low level play, it is still compelling. It's still fun. 
uh, it feels like they designed for like both types of players. Uh, what else to say, really? The game is genuinely funny. It doesn't need written, structured jokes to be funny. It just has good sound design, animations, nice, like... Everything's great. Everything about it is great. The tone, the, uh... The timing of things, the timing of, like, the boss intros and stuff, I don't know. Uh, it is a fantastic, fantastic game. I think I might give it a 10. I, I had not really actually given this much thought before. I can't think of much that I dislike about the game. At all. Yeah, it, it, at, at, on its surface, it does just seem like, oh, this is like a silly, funny game. But, uh... It really is impeccable. It is so good. It, it, it was shocking how good it was. I think another thing I'd like to say about this is how much it outclasses the series that it aims to pay homage to. I don't know if I can ever go back to Wario Land. Like, Wario Land 2, 3, and 4, I think, are all pretty solid games. And I haven't played Shake It yet. I'm, I'm going to have to at a certain point. And inevitably, I'm going to have to... Uh, I'm going to have to play Wario Land Shake It, and I'm going to constantly think, wow, I wish I was playing Pizza Tower instead. Because <laughs> it just takes every concept from Wario Land and runs with it. it particularly the uh, escape sequence thing, which has been done. Escape sequences are not, you know, exclusive to Wario Land. But I th it, ironically, Metroid is another thing that's pretty well known for escape sequences, and Pizza Tower also takes quite a bit of inspiration from Metroid. It has a fucking shine spark in it. But... I don't know. The, 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 especially the double lap thing. Everything around lap two, I think, is just such a genius idea. Because, again, they're accommodating for the design... Building the game around... You can either play it casually, or you can play it at, like, a high level. And so it's like, they give you basically plenty of time to complete it casually, to get to escape in one lap. But for the people who want to go the extra mile, there's also just enough, like a comfortable amount of time that if you're doing pretty, if you're like getting through the level quickly, you will be able to do a second lap without too much trouble. Like it is actually shockingly easy. It's another thing that's like shockingly attainable, uh, getting that second lap. Doing it with all, like, the secrets and all the toppings and shit, slightly harder, but I, I just think that's genius. And the music that plays when you go for lap two is ridiculous. <laughs> it, it is... Talk about, again, talk about, like, a dopamine rush. And, uh, yeah, I, I can imagine there's probably some people out there somewhere who, like, just couldn't get the hang of it and probably got really frustrated at, like, the time limit and the time running out. But I feel like that's got to be such a rare thing. They, they really did. They, they gave you, again, for doing just one lap, I think they gave you plenty. But wisely added on the, like, if you want to style on the level, you can go for lap two and get a ton of points. Perfect. Just perfect. Uh, anyway, Pizza Tower demos. I... Can I say, like, N.A. here? No, I, I don't think I should. I don't know, because this is a bunch of different games. Uh, <sighs> it says it on the screen here, but this was just a bunch of different builds and demo levels for Pizza Tower that came out before the actual game came out. I think, personally, none of these are really worth playing. I'm going to make a video on the Pizza Tower demos, and all the funny stuff that's in them, because there is a lot of funny stuff, will be in that video. And then you can just watch that video, and you never need to play these demos, because none of them control as well as the final game. And going from Pizza Tower to the previous demos feels like you're walking in molasses. Like, the, the controls, they just didn't have it figured out at a certain point. And, like, the level design, everything, it's just kind of lesser. Which is to be expected. It's just... More proof that it is a polished product. Uh, but I, I, I don't even really feel like I should rate these with a number, but I guess I will. Because it's a bunch of different ones. <laughs> Some of them sucked ass. Like the Grinch one was like a shitpost. 
but then some of them were basically bearable. I don't know. I might give I might give an NA here on the rating. I think I'm going to do that because I don't want to individually rank each one. I think I'm going to do that. Just N slash A. Can that please? Yes. I'm like, can the con conditional formatting please work on that one? Okay. Uh, moving on to Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe. This was a y unique, weird stream uh, because I was like, Bella, you should just play this and I'll just sit in the background and watch and like laugh. Uh, because I had already played the original Stanley Parable, or not the original, but the version that came before this. I have never played the uh, Half-Life 2 mod that is the actual original version of the game. I was pretty skeptical that the Ultra Deluxe Edition of Stanley Parable was going to like add anything really that good. I had heard that there was like a funny bucket in it, and I was like, oh, it just sounds kind of lame. But the Ultra Deluxe version actually added quite a bit of cool stuff. Cool, funny, interesting stuff. Uh, I think this is a game that, kind of like Braid, this game gets accused of being like up its own ass or like pretentious. I really think it's not something worth reading into that far. I think the game is just, it just has a very meta tone and it's just kind of deconstructive. It's not, I don't think it's meant to be taken super, super seriously or anything, but I think as a comedy game as sort of a this is kind of a genre now is the like find all the endings type it's it's kind of like a puzzle to find all the endings uh i think it's fantastic the the version you know the version that is not ultra deluxe the let me just side tangent here for a second and say the ultra deluxe edition i think when it first came out it was like if you own the original, you could get like a discount on the new one or something like that. But that deal ended. I don't know why that deal ended, but it ended up being that like in order to pay for Ultra Deluxe, I had to spend like $30 or something when I already owned the original Stanley Parable. That was a bit weird to me. Actually, how much was it? Let me look it up. So the original was... Oh, that's interesting. There's a bundle for the Stanley Parable and the Beginner's Guide. That's so funny, actually. The original is $14.99. Or again, not the original, but you know what I mean. $14.99, and then the Ultra Deluxe Edition is $24.99. And you no longer have the option of just like, oh, I'm just going to like upgrade my version to the Ultra Deluxe Edition. If I had to pay like 10 bucks to do that, that would be fine. I had to spend 30, I had to spend 25 extra dollars getting the Ultra Deluxe Edition, and that just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I don't really like to factor price uh, into reviews, but that was just something that particularly stuck out to me about this one. I also want to say, uh, somewhere up here is the demo, the unique demo level for the Stanley Parable, which I know I already reviewed it, but can I just say I love it when games have a unique level as the demo. With a, It's got a ton of unique dialogue. I think the demo was part of the reason why this game did so well. And the fact that they like sent out like customized versions of the demo to a bunch of YouTubers and shit, that was so cool. That, that was honestly awesome. Uh, like I remember the Game Grumps playing, or it was uh, Danny and Ross playing the Stanley Parable demo, and it, like, specifically said their names, and they were like, Ugh! and the demo, I think, so perfectly gets across what the game is going to be like without actually spoiling anything from the main game. Uh, so, anyway, tangent aside, Stanley Parable, very fun, very cool. It's genuinely funny. I, I think it is... It's very meta. It's very sort of self-referential especially the Ultra Deluxe stuff. The Ultra Deluxe stuff feels like a bunch of weird, humorous reflections on the success of the original Stanley Parable, which the Beginner's Guide is also a weird reflection of the success of the Stanley Parable. I think the Stanley Parable doing well fucked up Davy Reed's brain, in a way. <laughs> I think there's, there's a potential that that is true, at least. It was very cool. I didn't actually play the Ultra Deluxe content myself, but I think watching it is basically the same as playing it. Uh, I loved all the stuff with, like, 
<laughs> the, one of my favorite parts of the Ultra Deluxe thing was like the room that has all the accolades that Stanley Parable won and then you like go you like leave the room and then there's this huge like waste yard of just these huge bins full of steam reviews and like bad reviews for the game <laughs> I thought that was so well executed and so funny uh so good game solid game I don't know I... I'll give this one like an 8.5 Nah, I mean... <sighs> I don't know. There's not much I dislike about it. But I guess personally, it is still, in the end, basically a walking sim. I, I want to give it a 9. I, I don't see any reason why not to. Like, I prefer a little more active gameplay, is all. That's the only, I think like that's the only reason it's not a 10. But I think as as just a little thing, as a little experience, it's uh, I, I would give it a nine. Hold on, I gotta drink water. Oh. Okay. Hylix. This is another game that is difficult to rank. Let me just go ahead and say, for both of these, I recommend. <clears throat> but these are. Uh, these are games that are hard to specifically be like, oh yeah, I really enjoyed this specific aspect. No, I mean, I guess you can do that. This is a claymation game. Hylix is a claymation game with a very surreal art style and atmosphere. Very weird music. It's not like it's not like the kind of listen easy listening music for, from something like Snipper Clips. It's very, uh, I would call this a challenging piece. Uh, and it's a very sort of unforgiving, uncompromising game, this first Hylix game. Uh, for the first, like, half an hour of the game, I feel like most people are going to die a lot. It's basically a surreal, wacky, quirky RPG. Yes, I said it. Uh, with... It, but, like, really surreal. It's not like, oh, there's a floating trash can. This is so surreal. It's like... It's, something about it feels, like, primordial. And, like, kind of fucked up. And a lot of the characters' dialogue is actually randomized to a certain degree. Uh, which sort of gets across the point that the... Uh, The dialogue maybe doesn't matter so much a lot of the time, but it also, Hylix 2 kind of takes that and like contextualizes it in a weird way. Uh, I don't know. It, this is such a difficult game for me to talk about, but this is another one, I mean, totally different from the way Fortnite does it, but I feel like this is another like bucket of wet slop game where it is just such a unique experience to immerse yourself in that... Even though it has flaws, it is uh, still a really compelling and interesting experience. Uh, and it's got, like, basically fine RPG combat, too. I think in 2 it was better, but, you know, it's... I'm not the biggest fan of turn-based RPGs, but I think as it goes, it's, it's cool. Really what you're in this game for is the visuals. I think that's, like, the big crown jewel of this, is, like, the visuals and the sound and just the weird atmosphere that it's completely unlike anything I've ever played, even though it is a turn-based RPG where you can, you know, get together a party of four characters to defeat God. It's still very unique, very interesting. It's got such a cool vibe. That's 20 gift subs. Jesus Christ, I'm just talking about Hylix. Uh, thank you for those. That's pretty cool. Guys, show off those, uh, those cool emotes. That's the biggest one in a while. Um, and thanks for all the other subs. I mean, we've had a bunch of people subbing this stream. I don't know why. I don't know why. I'm just looking at an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, anyway, Hylix is a delightful, weird experience that I, I would definitely suggest... Giving a number grade to this just feels weird. Like, that's... Oh, God. I mean, am I going to give it an 8.5? <laughs> it, 
it, one of the things about this and the sequel is that they're both kind of jank, and sometimes jank in ways that is not fun. <laughs> like, sometimes there's fun jank. <clears throat> like, the fact that you can just... There's a hole in the ground at one point where you can get a paper cup, and you can just get infinite paper cups out of it. And that was never patched. Even though the game got patches, that shit was never patched. Sorry, I had to clear my throat. Uh, there's some frustrating jank to these games, but that's fine. You're in it for the personality and the atmosphere and the visuals. Anyway, uh... I want to type N-A so bad. I'll give it an 8.5. Fuck it. Oh, am I not on... I didn't click on the window. Okay. Uh, thank God I've got this little gradient of scores down here to just copy-paste the color. <laughs> Again, I have conditional formatting on this row, but whenever I copy and paste shit into there, the pasted rows don't have conditional formatting applied to them. Uh... Anyway, Hylix 2, in a lot of ways, is, is just a more polished version of Hylix 1 with, like, a ton of new stuff. I think Hylix 2 doesn't quite have the same... Like, because it's a little more polished of a game, it doesn't quite have the same... experience. It doesn't have the quite, quite the same atmosphere as the first game. It's a little more sensical. And there's a little more actual plot to it. I think there's less randomized dialogue. Like I said, this game also, without wishing to spoil, I guess, gives context to why the, fir why the first game feels so different. It actually gives an in-universe reason, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, this game actually, it also has some frustrating jank to it. Not too frustrating, but just slightly, there's just a bunch of little things that, that can kind of pile up, in my opinion. But that's just me. I think the combat in this game is fantastic. Uh, it is very based around status effects. It's like one of the, I've never played that many RPGs, but... I feel like this game really heavily centers around status effects more than any other RPG I've ever played in a way that's really fun. And I remember there's lots of like unique, interesting little strategies you can do to it. Uh, kind of similar to like Omori. Uh, with the status effects, like Omori's like emotion system. I remember there was a really fun combination near the end of the game where like I had something that gave me double strength but also made me gave me this like vulnerable stat that made me uh, take twice as much damage or something like that. But then I got a spell that takes your own status effects and applies it to every enemy. So I could just like basically bring them down with me and then use the insane amount of power that I had on like Wayne or whatever to kill them really easily. It was really cool. Uh, but I like the combat. It, pretty significantly more than the first one. And uh, the music in this game is a lot more easy to actually listen to. I think, you know, it's a good and a bad thing because, again, you don't get quite that, like, primordial, like, kind of fucked up feel of the first game. But you do... You do get some bangers. The... the there's a lot of bangers, actually. It's a really, really great soundtrack. But it still has some of the weird stuff in it. It's got some Mason stuff, some Chuck stuff, and that works, I think. That's a good mix. It's also worth noting that Hylix 2 recently uh, had a rock opera. <laughs> there's, there's a rock opera based around Hylix 2 that uh, is actually pretty good. And has Vinnie Vinesauce singing on one of the songs, which is fucking insane. Uh, anyway, I think I will give Hylix 2 a 9. It's very cool, very pretty. Uh, I think one of my favorite things about both of these games is the enemy designs. Um, yeah, guys, look up uh, Absent Moon on YouTube if you want to, uh, or on Bandcamp or whatever. There is a Hylix 2 rock opera, <laughs> and it's pretty damn good. Uh, personally, I prefer the instrumentals. I think the vocals... Vinny did a good job. I... And no disrespect to my king, Chuck, but, uh, I didn't, well, what the fuck is happening?
Oh, my ASMR video just ended and gave me a Red Bull ad and it scared the shit out of me. <laughs> oh, anyway. It's over. It's over now. It's over now. I just got like jump scared so hard by a Red Bull ad. Um, anyway. <laughs> Hylix and Hylix 2, both really, really cool games. Sort of have their own thing going on, each one, but uh, very cool. I cannot wait to see what crazy new project is coming out, because apparently Mason Lindroth is working another one, on another one. Um, what was... I, I feel like I trailed off. Oh, yeah. Just the design of all the characters and enemies in these games is so cool. It's like... It's not just like, oh, this enemy is like a weird dog. It's like, no, this enemy is like an incomprehensible, like Lovecraftian horror that I just, I don't even know what to like say about it, but like in a good way, like really interesting claymation creations. And uh, Hylix 2 also does this thing where there's, let me get this, let, let me make sure I'm getting this right. I think it's claymation models that have been scanned into a 3D modeling program like Blender or something, and then animated in that digital program. Like, there's some things that are still true claymation in Hylix 2, but a lot of things use that, uh, that sort of, like, weird half-computer-generated thing, and it's, uh, it, it's really interesting. It's very, like, it's very rough, you can definitely, a lot of times, tell the difference between something that was computer-generated and something that was uh, actually claimated. But I think, in a way, being able to see the cracks in the game, being able to see like all the like stray pixels on the sprites in Hylix 1, too. It's kind of like, ah, the joy of creation. It's just like... I don't know, it's just so raw, and, and I kind of like that aspect of it. A lot of the, like, jank in the animation is actually quite... It's adorable. It's cool. It's appreciable in a way. Uh, anyway. I gotta snort. Blanc. Okay, Blanc. This is definitely a not recommend. This is like a Nintendo Direct-ass game. Uh, this is a co-op game where one player is a small deer, I think, and one player is a small dog. And you're going through this artsy-fartsy, black-and-white snow world together, and uh, solving basic puzzles, working together. It, it was very bland. Uh, <clears throat> just, add, just add one line. A single line here. Hold on. Bland. Blankle. <laughs> bland. I don't know. It was so... That was such a, like, oh, I'm, like, making a review. Blank, more like bland. Uh, game was just not very fun and didn't really seem to have anything to say. The ending was such a, like, nothing ending. Both Isabel and I were both like, oh, there's got to be, like, a tragic ending. You know, it's got to be, like, the, the dog, like, eats the deer or something. I don't know. But no, it was just, it was even worse than being, like, a cliched ending. It was just, like, kind of a nothing ending. It felt like a game that was, and, and, listen. I kind of hate the phrase all style and no substance. But if I had to apply it to anything, I would apply it to this game. Where it was just, like, it looks like an artsy indie game, but doesn't have any of the, like, heart or interesting things that a lot of artsy indie games have so it was uh it was really disappointing it was honestly like one of the worst streams of the year not not worst streams but one of the worst games i've streamed this year just it was so disappointing it, it looked cute and inoffensive and i guess it was inoffensive but like it was just nothing it was just a waste of time let's give it like a three i don't know there were no, like, clipping errors on the fucking, like, 3D models. Give, give me a three. It, it looks basically fine, even though the art style also isn't that amazing. It, it kind of, like, once everything starts moving, you can definitely tell that it, it doesn't look that great. Anyway, uh, It Takes Two. This was a really... This was a wild game. This was a game of highs and lows. Uh, now... 
I want to address something and be very explicit and clear about this. I liked this game. I swear to God, people were like pulling a prank on me in the comments of these VODs. There was like a group of fucking people on, on like a Discord call or something being like, <laughs> write a comment saying that he hates it. <laughs> okay, everybody, everybody go like that comment. Everybody. I swear there was like a big like group prank of people like showing up on like every VOD insisting that I was just hating the game the entire time. I swear I was like the subject of like a big practical joke or something. I could not believe how much people were saying that. I liked it. I just had some issues with it. Like, I, I truly don't understand what was going on with this game at all. So let me just make that perfectly fucking clear. I thought it was cool. I just... There are things I disliked. Let's get into it. This is a co-op platformer. Uh, where you play as a divorcing couple. And uh, who, who are having... Uh, they are considering getting divorced, and they tell it to their kid, and their kid gets sad and cries on some dolls that she made of them, and the dolls become alive because of her tears, and uh, <clears throat> they have to go through this whimsical, exaggerated fantasy land version of their house, uh, and learn to work together, and sort of patch up their marriage for the kid, which is sort of a weird take like I, I it's it's pretty inoffensive as it goes like okay people who are in like the rough spot of a relationship are allowed to reconcile like it's not like oh i'm so offended that this game has that message of like oh yeah they reconciled for the kid they learned to love each other again and everything's fine sometimes people should divorce <laughs> sometimes people definitely absolutely should divorce but uh it was a bit of a weird take. I think my main problem overall with this game was the story and the characters. The characters talk way too much in cutscenes when it could just be like banter when they're running around. And they're also really unlikable. Like the main three characters, not including the kid, in like the first few hours of this game are just so hateable. They are such, like, detestable characters. You don't, like a, you don't like the mom, you don't like the dad, you don't like the fucking book. So I felt like, what the fuck was the point of the beginning of this story? Like, yes, establish that they're in the rough spot of a relationship, but oh my god, they established it way too much. So fucking much that I was like... I kind of hate all these characters now, and I don't even care if they get back together or not. They're just monsters, especially one of the most tonally dissonant parts of the game is when they decide... There's a bunch of, like, dumb plot contrivances where, like... Let me get, let me, let me get this completely straight. They think... They come up on, with this theory that, like, since... <laughs> okay... The kid is on the bed, and the parents, like, get up on the bed, and they're these tiny little toys, and they're like, oh, you know, look at us, look at us, we're here, we're your parents. And they're like, oh, shit, she can't see us. And she's, like, drawing on some, like, paper with something. And, but then they, like, move an eraser or something at some point, and go, oh, she can see the things that we move. Interesting. And so... Then they get the idea not to pick up a pencil and write, it's, hi, your parents are here, we're stuck in magic. Instead, they go, no. So her crying on the toys is what started all this, right? So that means if we get her to cry and touch her tears, then that'll cure us. A huge leap of logic, doesn't make any sense. So then they think, okay... In order to make her cry, since she can see the objects that we've in influenced, we're going to take her favorite stuffed animal and rip it to pieces and make her cry. And there's a whole level about them, like, infiltrating the castle of this stupid fucking, like, toy elephant and maiming it and, like, dismembering this stupid little toy elephant. And it's, and it's going like, please, no, I just want to be friends, no! And, it, and it's like... 
Why are you making me watch this? Why is this in the game? These people are monsters. They're stupid and they're evil. Like, I hate both of them after this sequence. Like, what the fuck? Literally, while it's begging for mercy in this, like, cutesy little voice, and it's, like, a, such a prolonged sequence, too, of them murdering it. I don't know if that was supposed to be funny or what. It was kind of, like, in a really sort of, like, dark way. It was sort of darkly humorous, but it just felt like a horrible misunderstanding of, like, the tone of the game. Did it work? No. The kid cried. They, they like, tore this elephant apart and shoved it off a cliff. And then the kid finds the toy elephant and she cries. And the parents dance in her tears. They, it sounds like I'm making this up, but this is literally exactly what happens in the game. The parents dance and the dad, like, rubs the tears into his fucking ass. It's unreal. It's unbelievable. And then it doesn't work, because of course it fucking didn't work, because why the fuck did you think that would work? And then there was another part later in the game where, like, they're reading a note, and it was like, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was like, Mom and Dad, the way to fix your marriage is... And then it's like they read the first part of the sentence, like three times but don't read the end of the sentence and then something like something comes and like rips up the note and like takes it away and they're like oh we need to know what's on that and i'm like why did you read the first half of the sentence a bunch of times that's not how humans work that's not real and then you go on this quest to find the four pieces of the note but the only information that you need is on the last piece of the note so why are we looking for all four pieces i don't understand <laughs> And, like, just the plot was dumb. The plot was fucking stupid, unlikable characters. And, like, I wouldn't be complaining about it as much if they didn't put that in focus for so much of the game. Like, I feel like half the time spent playing this game is watching these fucking cutscenes. And it was just, why, why? Anyway, the gameplay is fantastic <laughs> and really polished, has a fuck ton of variety, Great level design. I think a lot of Psychonauts 2 uh, vibes from this game. I don't know if they took influence or whatever, but uh, I, I think actually it came out like the same year as Psychonauts 2 or something like that, but it feels like Psychonauts 2 levels a lot of the time. Uh, really cool, like zany, whimsical designs. Good gameplay. Very polished gameplay. Shockingly polished for how many different types of gameplay there are. Like... It changes styles so frequently. Are we back? Oh, we are back. We are so back. We are so fucking back. I don't know what the fuck that was. Uh, I think server, local server just went down for a bit. I had internet, but it just went down. Hold on. Uh, let me actually... Can you guys hear me? Can you guys see me? Can everybody see me? I need to like download the first chunk of the VOD. I'm probably going to stop pretty soon anyway, but, uh, so what was the last thing you guys heard? Was it, uh, did I get to praising It Takes Two? <laughs> uh, the word so, okay, I'm going to need a little more context than that. You did get around to praising It Takes Two, okay. <laughs> I, the word so. Guys, that gives me nothing. Uh, it was a very... Okay, it changes styles so frequently, but the gameplay is always so polished. It really was astounding. Astounding the difference in quality between the story and the gameplay. Uh, there's some faster parts, there's some slower parts, there's rail grinding, a lot of good stuff. Uh... It was just a very enjoyable, like, if this game was all gameplay and no cutscenes, it would be so much better. Uh, but really, really high quality uh, gameplay. It was just so nice all around. Another thing that kind of bugged me was the ending. The ending just comes out of nowhere. And, like, it's this weird thing where, like, all of a sudden, the, like, central focus of the plot of the game is about, like, the mom getting the courage to, like, sing in front of a crowd. And that's, like, the main emotional beat at the very end of the game. And then it just ends. And I'm like, what? Like, why did it 
end on that scene. Very strange. Uh, so, yeah, game of highs and lows, for sure. Uh, but very cool, very creative, very fun. Yes, recommend. Uh, maybe just skip all the cutscenes. Because there's nothing, there was almost nothing in the cutscenes besides the, like, elephant murder shit that surprised me. I was like, yeah, basically, like, after you watch a few cutscenes, it's like, yeah, you basically can see where the rest of the game is going to go from here. Um, okay. Let's, and beautiful, stunning visuals, too. It just looks great. And everything goes by so fast, it almost feels like a waste that it looks so great. Uh, let's give this, like, an 8. I don't know. Yeah, 8. Hey, I feel like it's a solid 8 game. I literally liked the game. I, like that, I, 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 that's why I felt like people were just trying to wind me up about this. Is because I literally enjoyed it. I liked it. I, like, I liked it. Okay, hold on. The other stream is now downloading. Oh, God, no. Get that out of here. It's because the little download thing popped up. There was also, I guess... One other thing about this game is that there were a bunch of little, like, side mini-games that always just felt like a complete fucking waste of time. That was, like, the one issue I had with the gameplay, but it's ignorable. You can just not do them and be fine. Where it's like, oh, now you're playing a little versus game versus the person that you're playing with, and I think Bella and I never enjoyed a single one of those. They were just super whatever. It just felt like... Oh, now you're playing a, a, a subpar Mario Party game. Yippee. <laughs> but, it, yeah, and there's... <laughs> Somebody said the chess minigame, where you just play chess. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> anyway. Uh, DuckTales. The, the big, big contrast between It Takes Two and then DuckTales. I think, let's try to get through these games. I will indeed do Lilo and Stitch 2 Hamster Veal Havoc. <clears throat> I didn't do review streams for about like six months or something because the upcoming arc the upcoming review stream was going to be me going through a bunch of bullet hell shooters that I remember to varying degrees and some of them I remember like nothing about. Like this one, Mars Matrix, don't remember at all. So I'm going to need to like go refresh my memory on my opinion on these games before I can actually review them. But then that just made it so I just didn't do review streams for like six months. And that's how we piled up this list. We, we like bulked up the list of games again with a bunch of games that I played in between now and then. Uh, but then after, again, after we get through that part, then we got a bunch of fun stuff where I can just review all the Sonic games that I've played, all the Metal Slug games I've played, you know, all the From Software games. That's just going to be one stream on its own, I feel like. Eat a tire on camera. No. <laughs> Why? Uh... <laughs> Babe, are you, on, are you on Twitch chat while you're working? <laughs> you just decided to, to stop by. Uh... And then at the end, we're going to do... Guys, finally... I know I'm tangenting again, but we finally played, like, we're going to do one more Street Fighter Six stream. Oh, these perfectly fit on one screen like this. That's so satisfying. We have now played every Street Fighter game that I intend for us to play. How fucked is that? We went, we went hard. We went all the way through all the, like, salient points of the series, including, like, Marvel and shit. That's so satisfying. Every street has been fought. Like, I finally, like, I have a little list, and I got to cross off Street Fighter Six the other day, and I was like, yes. Okay. DuckTales. This was a pretty good NES game. Uh, I felt like the first level was, like, the worst part of the game, but maybe that was just me getting the hang of it or something. Uh, but... And, and, you know, it's not technically the first level, because you can do the levels in any order, but it's the first one on the list. Uh, this is a platformer, pixel art platformer, about Scrooge McDuck bouncing on his cane, which apparently he never actually does in the original show. They just made it up for this game. But it's actually a pretty fun platformer, you know, it's got good controls, the bouncing mechanic is fun, it's pretty simple, but fun. Uh, 
it has a lot of issues that old NES games have of just like kind of brutal design out of nowhere. Uh, the thing that I thought was really weird was on the first level, you have to like get a certain amount of money to reach the boss of the area, but they never make you do that again. But it was such a huge pain in the ass in the first level. But then after I got past that, the game got like way easier. But I also used like save states and shit. Uh, but it was it was quite good. Um, this game's got really good music for an NES game. Everybody knows the classic moon theme. Uh, that is like probably the most famous part of this game. Uh, cute sprite work. Nothing too exceptional for the NES, but it is a decent uh, Capcom platformer. It feels very Mega Man-y at times. Some of the levels, there's like one level in particular, like Transylvania or whatever, that was kind of maze-like and annoying, but it wasn't too much of an issue. Uh, it was it was overall a pretty fun game. It's like NES games aren't like real games, but <laughs> and I, that's that's an exaggeration and kind of a joke. But uh, honestly, I'm on the fence on whether or not to actually recommend this one, just because I, there's not a ton like to it. Like there's not, it's like not like oh you know you haven't played platformers until you've played Ducktales. It's like no, it's just an acceptable one. You know. I, but I definitely think it is part of the pantheon of, like, 20 NES games that are actually still fun to play. I did give Stanley Parable a 9. I surprised myself with that. I didn't think it was gonna... Like, if you had asked me before this stream, oh, you're gonna give it a 9? No. But I couldn't think of much that I disliked about it. Um, okay. <sighs> I don't know. As, again, as NES games go, sure, I would recommend it. It's no punch-out, but it's, uh, it's fine. Let's give it, like, a 6.5? Does that seem good? Uh, Baby Boomer. This was a bootleg NES game. Never actually was officially endorsed by Nintendo. Uh, I just thought it was funny because of the name, but actually the game is kind of interesting. It's not fun, it's not good, but it's interesting. Where there's like a little baby crawling along on the ground, and there's a bunch of hazards coming at it, and you are a sniper who has to shoot down all the hazards coming at the baby. And it has light gun functionality. Like, you can, you, you can play it just using a little cursor on screen. But you can also play it with the fucking zapper, which is insane. Uh, I don't know how it plays with the zapper, because I didn't have it on an actual NES. I actually considered buying this game in cartridge form a long time ago, but did not want to commit to the bit. At that time, I didn't even know it was a zapper-compatible game. I had no idea how it played. But... Uh, it's kind of an interesting gameplay style. It's very frustrating. It's got some of the worst NES music loops that I've ever heard in my goddamn life. Uh, just, like, painful to listen to music that, that lasts, like, ten seconds before it repeats. Like, so bad. It was, like, driving me mental by the time I was done with the game. And I save-stated through it because it is very brutal. Uh... But the game is unique, if nothing else. Not really much else to say about it. The visuals are pretty bad, too. Lots of, like, NES visual error type things. If that makes any sense. Uh, I mean, no. Definitely not recommend. I'd give it, like... You know what? I'm gonna be charitable and give this, like, a three and a half. <laughs> that, that's charitable for this game. Um... And it also has, yeah, it has a cliffhanger ending that says, wait till Baby Boomer 2 to figure out how this cliffhanger gets resolved. Because it's like, you find spoilers for Baby Boomer, you find your mom, but it's not actually your mom. She's like, oh, hello, Michael. I've been looking for you. And the baby's like, I'm not Michael, I'm Boomer. And she's like, oh, where is my son? <laughs> And it's like nothing, nothing gets resolved. I didn't even know there was anything to resolve. But then when it ends, it's like, ah, nothing got resolved. Cool. 
It's better than Blanc. Did I really rate it higher? <laughs> better than Blanc. No. Okay. That's fine. Uh, Disney's Lilo and Stitch 2 Hamster Feel Havoc. I think I stand by it. I got more enjoyment. It was more fun and funny to save state my way through Baby Boomer for the NES than it was to slog through Blanc on, like, the fucking Nintendo Switch. I guess we played it on Steam. Baby Boomer clears Blanc. <laughs> I s see, the thing is, I stand by it. I stand by that. Uh, okay, Disney's Lilo and Stitch 2 Hamster Feel Havoc. Uh, this was another nostalgia hit for me, similar to SpongeBob SquarePants Return of the Flying Dutchman, or Revenge, or whatever the hell it's called. I can never remember. Uh, this is a functional, but very boring 2D platformer. It has some ideas of its own. Uh, I kind of, like, the Stitch, there's Stitch levels and there's Lilo levels. The Stitch levels, you're just running around basically playing shitty Metal Slug. Where there's literally, the enemy variety is literally one type of enemy in different colored outfits. Which is insane. Like, some of the worst enemy variety I've ever seen in a video game. But, uh... Then the Lilo levels are more like puzzle-oriented, where you're using the other experiments from the Lilo and Stitch universe to uh, solve various puzzles. Again, it is inoffensive. The game is very crusty. It's got really, like, crusty, bad cutscene art. Uh, that's just, like... It's clearly not, like, constructed sprites. It's just shit that was copy-pasted from the show or the movie and then, like, compressed down into shitty GBA resolution. And it just looks like... The, the story stuff looks like ass. And it's got one of the most pathetic final bosses I've ever seen in my life. Uh... It was, it's, like, laughable how pathetic it is. I, I don't know if it was meant to be a joke or what, because he's a hamster. I don't know. Uh, but the game, it was one that I could just, like, breeze through in an afternoon, like, just in, like, two or three hours, thankfully. Uh, it's got some half-decent music, but most of it's really annoying, <laughs> kind of repetitive, grating GBA music. Uh, there's these shitty, like, 3D-esque driving levels that blew my mind when I played them as a youngin, but now they're, they're just nothing to me. It's like, why would I do this when I could be playing Mario Kart Super Circuit? Uh, definitely would not recommend, but it, it's not terrible as, as like, it is shovelware, but it's not the worst. You know? Uh... I don't know. Now I'm just thinking about its relation to Blanc. Uh, I give it like a four. No, I I would actually also rank this a three point five. I, sometimes I'm scared of giving two things in a row the exact same score, but sometimes that's just how it works. Okay, getting over it with Bennett Foddy. This was a recent kind of obsession of mine. Uh. This is another game, I, I, this is my stream of defending games that are accused of being pretentious. I hated this game before I ever played it. When I watched, like, Dunkey and, like, Germa play it, I think. I was like, oh, this just seems like a stupid, like, rage bait game where the guy, like, taunts you and tries to get you all pissed off. But, uh, that was only from a very, like, you know, through the, through the glass... Uh, observation of it. Actually playing it, I think it is actually an incredibly unique, compelling, interesting game. Yes, it's like... It's a game that definitely is meant to be frustrating, but as the title suggests, it's sort of like... It's, it's like a therapeutic game. It's like a therapy experience, where it starts out really frustrating, but then through your trials and tribulations and struggles, you get way better at using this, like, very awkward, unconventional control scheme. And it's actually a very uh, sort of uplifting experience doing that. Which uh, is, is kind of undercut by the fact that 
apparently the creator of the game had not even completed the game before it was done, before it was like released. That's, a, that's its own thing. I don't know. I feel like this game has a lot to say about the nature of accomplishment, challenge, uh, victory, improvement. It really made you think. It really made me think. Makes you think about a lot of different things like that. Uh, and how... I don't know. Sometimes it's fun to, like, despair at something. And sometimes it's fun to, uh, as, as Bennett Foddy put it, to taste defeat. It, it, in a way, that is a compelling, like, that is, that is a compelling, underrated part of a challenge in a game like this. Uh... It was a very unique, interesting experience. I really enjoyed hearing a lot of, like, this is something I never thought, if you had asked me about this game a few months ago, I would have been like, oh yeah, it just seems like dumb rage bait. But I actually really quite enjoyed listening to the narration uh, and, and hearing what Bennett Foddy had to say about the creation of this game, the inspiration for this game, his opinions about, like, challenge in video games and stuff. Uh, even just talking about it now, I feel like I'm not selling it very well. And sometimes it turns into slam poetry, which was very uh, funny, but also kind of neat. Uh, anyway, it was a cool experience, and I think it, it, it's so... One of the coolest parts about this game is how the first time you beat it, it will take... I think on average, I would be willing to guess like five, seven hours or so. I think I took like eight hours. Uh, but then the second time you beat it, it takes like 20 minutes. I've played this game. Hold on. There's, there's achievements in this game. There's one for beating it once, one for beating it twice, and once for, one for beating it 50 times. Right after I was done streaming this game, I got the second achievement. And every day I have been beating this game at least once, just as like a little bit of practice, working my way up to the 50 achievement. I don't know if I'll ever get it, but I've done six so far. And my most recent run was like 12 minutes or something. And that is such, what an unbelievably liberating feeling. What, what a great feeling it is to be like, wow, this thing that used to be so difficult for me is now something that I can just do while I'm, like, watching a video and do it in, like, ten minutes. You know, like, that is, that is an unbelievable feeling. Uh, and it's a feeling that not many other games have given me. Is it better than Sexy Hiking? I would say so, yeah. And Sexy Hiking is also kind of neat, in a similar way. Uh, but yeah, and, and, and getting over it also feels, it, it, talk, speaking of sexy hiking, it, it feels like a tribute to sort of B-games of that style, even though it's actually quite polished. Like, the, I think it, it's got a neat little style. It looks good. I enjoy sort of conceptually the fact that you're, like, climbing over a gigantic trash heap, basically. <laughs> uh, it's all very cool. I, I, I enjoyed this game way more than I thought I would. I thought I would never enjoy it. Yeah, Celeste has a similar feeling of, like, first time you beat it, it's super hard, and then second time, it's, like, kind of a breeze. Uh, anyway, very cool. Have you heard about the recent Ape Out Devs x Bennett Foddy collab? Bennett Foddy was, like, one of the main devs be behind Ape Out, right? Are you talking about Baby Steps? Because, uh... Recently, okay, and by the way, some people got pissy at me when I started playing Getting Over It, and I was like, wow, Bennett Foddy just cannot stop himself from making games with awkward control schemes. And now, just the other day, a new game by Bennett Foddy with an awkward control scheme is, has been announced. <laughs> I, I think I stand by what I said. He made fucking Quop, Gurp, Plan B, Getting Over It, and now he's doing baby steps. I think this is his thing. Like, the, he loves that. Um, anyway, I think I would recommend this game. I think this game gets a bad rep. I, I, it, it saddens me that it is perceived as just, like, rage bait, silly game. Even though I, I fell for that. Like, I, I had the same opinion of it. Um, it. The game gave me a lot to think about. And 
is a unique experience and that's sometimes that's all you can ask for i think i would give this i would give this an 8.5 it was not like the most mind-blowing thing i've ever played it was not like oh new favorite game material or anything it was just a very cool neat little game that i feel like i got a lot out of uh and i think we're done i think we're done for today I'm going to have to, like, stitch these two streams together, so get ready for the uh, Bandicut logo to appear at the end. VOD viewers. Yeah, Deltarune, uh, Bikman, and Katamari Reroll. I'll probably do next time, I guess, Deltarune, no. We'll see about Deltarune. I should probably just review that, but I I'm done for today. And then I swear, guys, I want you guys to, like, annoy me and, like, bug me about doing more of these streams. If you like them. If you don't like them, then, you know, don't feel obligated to. But if you like them, please pester me. Please. To do more of these, because uh, I, I find it difficult to, like, work up the schmism to actually, like, stream these. Because, I, I don't know, they're, they're kind of daunting doing these streams, especially this one. But I think next time what I'm going to do is just review the ones that I remember and then skip the rest of them, do some, review some other stuff, and then I can get them, like, piecemeal later on. Instead of having to, like, study on every bullet hell that I've played to try to remember all the unique differences between them. Because some of them kind of blend together. Uh, so anyway, we will do that another time. I'm sure there will be other games that show up on the list that I've streamed recently that we'll also do with those uh, I hope you guys got a kick out of this. I really enjoy doing these, even though they are uh, sort of mentally taxing and, and my throat hurts. <laughs> it doesn't hurt, but, you know. Uh, shall we go raid somebody? Yeah, I don't think there will be any more streams today, no. Still too busy uh, playing... Phoenix Wright in all of my off-stream hours. Although, I would really like to get an Isaac video out by tomorrow. I'm going to try to do that. But if it doesn't happen, then maybe Sunday? Oh, yeah. 3x Pog special event. Who should we raid? We, sh we, we keep seeing AI Jesus at the top of the fucking front page. I guess you guys couldn't hear. I, like, clicked onto somebody's stream and it, there was audio. But I have that muted because I'm listening to ASMR. <laughs> How do you find the third game's music? It's better than the second game's. The second game's music was honestly, like, kind of mid. First game, I... How are they ever going to top that shit? Guys, I know what Turnabout Jazz Soul, like, is now. I always saw, like, that Fragrance of Dark Coffee video on YouTube. Like, I feel like everybody knows that song. But now, now that I've played Phoenix Wright, I, like, now understand that music. I, and, like, now I want to listen to that whole album again. Um, anyway. Still loving it. Still really enjoying Phoenix Wright. It's a bit of a... It, binge playing it, like playing it a lot over the course of like a week or so, it can be kind of taxing just because of how much text there is, but uh, still still having a great time. Let's go raid somebody playing uh, We Heart Katamari. How about it? Oh my god, there's so many VTubers in the world. Dear god. Yeah, uh, fuck it. This person seems enthusiastic. Let's go raid Shiny Pichu. And uh, I hope you guys have fun watching this person. And I hope you guys enjoyed the stream. I'm going to have to go stitch these together. Uh, oh wait, I can't say Bandicut yet. I just got to sit here and drum my fingers. Okay, now we can raid uh, Bandicut logo.